Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Yes, we're back. We're back in more than one sense of the word. Marco Mangosdorf is back. <clears throat> he's been traveling all over the place, and now he's back. And we have the joy of being able to talk to him on his home turf and talk about his trip. Marco, welcome back, and welcome back to the show, too. Well, a very heartfelt sub ID, which is the greeting in, in the Lao PDR, kind of similar in sound to Sawadika, which is a common greeting, of course, in uh, in Thailand. Sawadika, I remember that. Yeah. Sawadika. So yeah, I've missed you, Jay. It's been six weeks since uh, since we haven't spoken. I think we're just kind of a record of uh, us not talking. So it's uh, good to be back and good to be back on uh, on this Monday with uh, my good buddy uh, and fellow uh, crusader for all all purposes and crusades good and worth fighting uh, Jay Fidel so thank you so much yeah the truth me. lives here Marco anyway um, so I you know I was you, when we did talk you told me that you were studying energy in Southeast Asia all those countries you visited and that is really a turn-on because I want to hear all about it let's put a map up and see where you went so interesting okay we're zooming in now in Southeast Asia and that would be you know north of Malaysia and that would be uh, Thailand, it would be Myanmar, it would be Laos, Cambodia, uh, and it would be Vietnam. And you went to all those places, am I right? I, I have been to all five of the countries you just said, Jay, but this past trip was just uh, Thailand and the Lao PDR, People's Democratic Republic. And my interest uh, was kind of sparked in terms of energy, politics, and security. Uh, for that part of the world in a, when I was on my way to China uh, several years ago and for, I saw an article in the English language China Daily as I was uh, waiting for a flight from Beijing to Shanghai and uh, it was talking about a meeting of the foreign ministers of the five, actually six countries, including uh, People's Republic of China because the Mekong River is kind of the artery that connects all six of those countries with the Mekong, one of the, the world's mightiest rivers, so to speak, starting in the um, high, altitude, uh, uh, high altitudes of southern China and then flowing down south either through or by all five of those countries, Myanmar, Lao PDR, Vietnam, Cambodia, and, uh, and Thailand. Yeah, let's take one more look at the map and just uh, sort of track on that while, while you're, you're speaking of it. So the, uh, the river, Mekong River, starts in China, and it enters, where does it enter, uh, in Myanmar? Uh, I believe, actually, no. Uh, well, I, I'm sorry I didn't, uh, I should have provided a map of, uh, of the Mekong, but yeah, I believe you're right. It does first go into Myanmar or, or cruises by Myanmar before going into the Lao PDR. So it's, it, it's one of these rivers in the world that affects all the countries that it either flows through or by, both uh, from multiple perspectives. One, of course, is energy production with the uh, building of many, many, many hydroelectric dams, uh, cultivating and harnessing uh, energy. Uh, agriculture, of course, irrigation, uh, pollution. So when you have a river that is going through country A, B, C, D, E, F, G on down the alphabet, uh, there is a strong motivation on the part of those countries to work together because uh, even though the river may flow exclusively through your uh, country, let's say uh, upstream, eventually it exits your country and goes to the next country, the next country, the next country, in this case before it empties out in the, uh, the, uh, the Mekong River Delta, which is not far from the city of Saigon, also known as Ho Chi Minh City, off of the south, um, uh, southeast China, southeast, southeast Vietnamese coast. So that's where I kind of focused on, on the Mekong being this thread that connects the uh, these five countries, and I see on the screen there you're showing a photo that I took when I went on a little bit of a river ride, uh, and it's really incredible how wide this river is and at this time of year, since it's still kind of the tail end of the, the rainy season, the monsoon season, how incredibly muddy 
it is, but I'm told that in the drier months of the year, it becomes more kind of greenish. So, you know, when you, when you think about historically that human beings have obviously needed water, right? We need water to survive, and going back thousands of years, whether it's the Nile, the Mekong, the Brahmaputra River, which flows through India and uh, southern China and Tibetan Plateau, that the uh, rivers are a source of life, a source of commerce, a source of, of so many things. So. Uh, I decided I would look at the Mekong and see how is it that these countries work or don't work together, how they conflict, how they cooperate in terms of managing the Mekong when it comes to to uh, power generation and the effect, uh, in the case of the Lao PDR, the effects of, of having multiple dams, uh, many dozens and dozens of dams on the Mekong or tributaries to the Mekong. And that just sparked my interest uh, kind of intellectually and practically several years ago. So every time I go back, I, I dig a little bit deeper. I was able to talk to uh, somebody from USAID, which is part of the State Department at the uh, embassy in Vientiane in Laos, and had a, a really superb time kind of getting his on the ground, boots on the ground uh, impressions of, of energy issues there. And kind of the, you know, one of the big takeaways, Jay, is we're talking about uh, 230 plus million people in that part of the world. Uh, you know, compare that to the United States population with somewhere over 300. So it, it, there are a lot of people there with the two biggest countries population-wise being number one, Vietnam, and then Thailand. And the economies of these uh, countries, the Mekong Five, as they call them, uh, to varying degrees, are growing by five, six, seven plus percent uh, quantitatively uh, on a year-to-year basis. And when you have that kind of economic growth, quantitative economic growth, you have a commensurate increase, if not a manifold increase, in the amount of energy that those economies need more and more and more of. So, you know, it's kind of interesting timing in that the IPCC International Panel for Climate Change came up with a report this past weekend warning of rather dire consequences unless we get our act together in terms of uh, carbon dioxide and the greenhouse gases. And uh, energy, along with fl- flatulence from cows, which we can't seem to do a whole lot about, but the consumption of energy, especially carbon uh, or, and coal, is, it plays a huge role. So how these countries develop, as they will develop and, the, and grow, uh, is going to be substantially affected by the availability of energy. Where is the energy going to come from? What's going to be the cost of the energy? Uh, who's going to be buying it? So uh, I should probably... Yeah, and what, and what they do, what these countries do, uh, has a significant effect on the world. 200 and some odd million people, 30 million people has an effect on the world. So we want them to be clean if they can. Are they clean? It uh, really depends on the country. And to focus on Laos, which has become kind of new, uh, near and dear to my heart for a number of reasons, country of about 7 million people that uh, is ruled by one of only five in the world, five ruling dominant monopoly control communist parties, the Lao People's Democratic Republic. The folks there have been able to tap into the Mekong and the tributaries to electrify the country to well over 90 percent which is pretty darn good for the developing world, and compare that to an electrification rate on, in neighboring Myanmar, also known as Burma, of somewhere under 40 percent. And one of the ways that the Lao government and the party have been able to do that is by throwing up hydroelectric dams like crazy. There are now more than 50, 5 zero, 50 major hydro dams on the Mekong and the tributaries, and there are, get this, another 300-plus in the pipeline. So the major source of export earnings, in fact, for that small country of 7 million is selling electricity to its neighbors, principally to Thailand, Vietnam, and also to the Chinese. Mm. So one of the, one of the, which sounds all well and good because you think, well, hydro, that's not as bad as burning carbon or coal or petroleum, and, and, and I would agree with that. But at the same time, uh, there was this tragedy earlier this year where one of the dams failed along the Mekong and caused serious flooding damage and death uh, because of of the failure of the dam. So the, the government in Vientiane has uh, kind of put the pause, uh, pushed the pause button in terms of yeah. full speed ahead on hydro, but I have no doubt whatsoever that after the pause, 
and after the studies they'll do in terms of trying to come up with a failure mode for the dam, that they will put uh, the, uh, the the gears into full full speed ahead again, uh, because uh, like I said, hydro power uh, provides them the bulk of their export earnings, and the Chinese and the Vietnamese and the Thais are going to want nothing but more and more and more sure, power for so developing what, economies. But you know, let me let me ask you this though: when you when you have the upper part of a river and you use it, say, for hydroelectric or maybe other things, uh, you kind of control the flow of the water. And so there are geopolitical implications for a country that is higher up on the river uh, as against one that is lower down on the river. Does that right. play out? I mean, do we find that there's geopolitical maneuvering going on over these rivers and the dams on the rivers and the sluicing off for agriculture? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's why the need for cooperation and regular consultations amongst the, the countries there that, that share the Mekong do take place on a regular basis. And I, I can't say at this point I'm an expert enough to know just how well they're playing nicely together versus... Um, versus not, it appears to me that at least on the surface, the relationship between the the Lao Party, uh, Communist Party and the government and the Vietnamese is very, very strong. The relationship between the Lao Central Party and, and government and, and, and Beijing is very, very strong. That said, uh, in conversations I had with some of the locals there, both in Vientiane and Luang Prabang, is that there is kind of a base level of, uh, of uh, I want to be careful here, uh, distrust and discomfort that a lot of the Lao people feel towards the Chinese for uh, because of fear that uh, you know the Chinese money is coming in at such healthy clips into to the Lao PDR that it is uh, changing things not necessarily for for the good so even though on on one level in terms of party to party relationship and government to government relationship there's a strong dependency that uh, the folks in Vientiane feel towards the Chinese, but at the same time, on the more grassroots level, there is a distinct discomfort amongst typical Lao people in terms of more and more and more Chinese influence. But then again, that's not anything unique, right? Because if you look throughout the region with the Chinese, especially under Xi Jinping, spreading their economic wealth and also growing their, their military influence and military assets in the South China Sea and elsewhere, that there is more and more kind of pushback uh, on the part of the Vietnamese. Uh, even uh, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines seems to be pushing back a bit more against Beijing after being buddy-buddy initially after he was elected president. So it, there, there's uh, an interesting dynamic going out with clearly China is the dominant player in that region, but uh, there's uh, it, it's, it's coming at a cost, I think, yeah. and I think... Well, There's going to be more and more pushback on oh, the Oh, yeah. And it's uh, happening in Africa, too, the same way. You know, it's all about infrastructure. Right. Infrastructure like ports, infrastructure like dams. And as China, you know, expands west with the one belt, one road into Africa, uh, these small countries don't have the capital, nor do they have the construction resources. China comes in uh, and makes them a big loan. And then China takes the contract to build the infrastructure. And when it's, when it's all said and done, uh, it's not feasible. And so what happens is the country doesn't have the revenue from the project to pay the loan, and China often, often is not, winds up owning the infrastructure and still having a substantial loan. So uh, small countries resent that, and the word's getting around about it. I, I think that China will have to uh, reorganize its policy over that. Otherwise, these small countries are going to be very suspicious not only in Southeast Asia, but everywhere along the One Belt, One Road. But let me ask you one question, though, Marco. It, and it dawned on me when we first started covering Southeast Asia. You know, they have a lot in common. They have the Mekong in com common. They have cultural points in common. They have their agriculture, their food even, in common. Uh, Southeast Asia should be, don't you think, one country. It should come together. Uh, now, right now, there's the ASEAN group, but that's really not very mm, together. Um, and, and, the, and the question I put to you, as I have put to many people over time, is do you think there's a chance, you know, having traveled and come back recently, uh, do you think there's a chance that Southeast Asia will come together in our lifetimes? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I think the 
the forces, the nationalist ethnic forces in that region of 230 million are far too disparate. And uh, I mean, I can't, they're, as you probably will recall, there's been a pseudo-military, uh, I won't call it a dictatorship because they have kind of a veneer of democracy to some extent in Thailand, but there has been you know, civilian government after civilian government in the past 10 or so years uh, that have been overthrown by the Thai army. And it's been that way, uh, military rule essentially for the past several years since the last overthrow of the duly elected civilian government. And I just see the forces for fragmentation to be way, fragmentation and, and distinct nationalism to be far too strong for the foreseeable indefinite future that would make any type of integration of, of these five countries, given their history, Jay, which goes back, of course, hundreds and hundreds of years. I mean, lest we forget, there was a war between China and Vietnam in 1979. There was a war between Cambodia and Vietnam in 1979. Uh, there are continuing military activities and, and rogue areas of Myanmar up in the north uh, that make it a no-go zone for the military there, and it's off limits for U.S. Embassy personnel to travel. So there are, there are still still forces of fragmentation and disintegration going on mm. in a number of those parts of the world mm. that I, there's no way I could see there being some type of unification mm. uh, amongst people of different language, different culture, different histories that would allow them to put it aside. I mean, so you know, sorry to hear that. They'd be so much happier if they could get together and be <laughs> a significant, um, you know, consolidated group of countries. Anyway, let me, uh, let me take a break right now, Marco. We'll be right back. When we come back, I would like to talk about the, uh, the energy, the clean energy, other, other than hydro, uh, that you have seen uh, you know, being developed in Southeast Asia. We'll be right back with Marco Mangelsdorf. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hello and welcome to Out of the Comfort Zone. I am your villainous host, R.B. Kelly. Today we are playing two truths and a lie, and I will tell you two truths, and you will tell me which one is the lie. Truth number one, this is a real mustache. Truth number two, I want you to watch my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. So tune in and let me know which is the truth and which is the lie. I'm R.B. Kelly with Out of the Comfort Zone, and show up next Tuesday to see my mustache live. We are back. We are so happy to to get together with Marco Mangelsdorf again. It's really wonderful to hear him back and to hear him talk about his trip to Southeast Asia. So Marco, I wanted to ask you, as I made, indicated before the break, about the non-hydropower that we see that you saw in Southeast Asia on your trip. Uh, for example, uh, photovoltaic. Did you see it? How much of it did you see? In what form did you see it? What did you learn about it there? Is there anything we could learn and use from Southeast Asia? Uh, a lot of questions packed into that, what you just said, Jay. So kind of in no particular order, uh, in Laos, solar has taken a backseat in terms of large-scale power development to hydro because the hydro has been so much uh, easier picking, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But that said, I've looked at some uh, some government reports and, and predictions, uh, projections over the next uh, handful of years, and they're expecting a, an increase in solar a PV to 165 fold. But uh, as you and I both know, if you're starting off from a very low baseline, it's uh, easier to do 165 fold in terms of increase. But nonetheless, they are recognizing that uh, having solar PV is a good thing. In fact, uh, one of the biggest uh, plants uh, is a rooftop solar, uh, not sorry, rooftop uh, parking shade structure in the Vientiane Airport which is about 300 kilowatts, fairly small size compared to utility scale, and it was provided largely by the Japanese. 
And uh, in the past year, there was a several megawatt plant outside of the Intian, which was also commissioned. So I asked the guy uh, from the, the U.S. Embassy, Anders uh, Imboden, uh, with USAID a couple weeks ago, three several weeks ago, said, I don't understand why would they would want to go with more solar when there's so much cheaper hydro. And he said, well, that's a great question, and the reason is because there are areas where uh, stringing large uh, uh, transmission lines uh, uh, are gonna, is going to be rather cost prohibitive. In other words, you need to bring the hydro to uh, to the end user, which can be difficult in terms of terrain or however far it is from the hydro station. So where you have uh, the, the advantage of a solar plant, you can plunk it down much more easily and have distributed generation where you need it. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is there are times of the year uh, during the drier months which uh, typically are from, let's say, November to May. Uh, in other words, the non-monsoon season where there's a lot less water. So you supplement whatever reduction in hydro that you have with the addition of solar which means uh, it's a good combo. You, so as the sun is you know, more bountiful, less rain, you have more solar, and once the other way around, you have more hydro. It so reminds I, me of coal and ice, the old coal and ice dichotomy. It's the same thing with solar and, and hydro. <laughs> when you don't have solar, use the water. When you don't have exactly. water, use the solar. <laughs> You know, and in terms of the players, uh, given the fact that uh, their nearest neighbor, I mean, it, it, you can see Thailand right across uh, from the Mekong and Vientiane. I mean, across the river, there's northern Thailand. So in Thailand being one of the two economic heavyweights on, on in the region along with Vietnam, the Thais are very heavily involved in Laos, and there's a similar kind of ethnic bonds and, and language similarities between the Thais and the Laos. So they're on friendly terms, so it would make sense that you would have Thai companies uh, working actively in the Lao PDR to develop both hydro resources, transmission distribution into Thailand, and also solar. So there, there's a lot of cooperation which goes on, and uh, I, I see that continuing. So I have no doubt that there's going to be more and more solar. Who's, who's building it? Did you see uh, Americans, for example, building it? Did you see American equipment, American photovoltaic cells, and and uh, accessories did you or did you see chinese did you see european where does it come from and who is developing the grids because at the end of the day you can have great panels but it doesn't mean too much unless you have a great grid also I think largely the Chinese and the, and the Thais are the ones who are working with uh, the Lao uh, government and the, the utility folks there to develop both the infrastructure, generating facilities and the infrastructure to get power where it needs to go because um, they have uh, you know easier source of, of, of financial resources to do stuff that typically ain't cheap to do. So. Uh, the Chinese have established a number of PV manufacturing facilities in Thailand to be able to serve the region. So I think it's more likely to see uh, Thai equipment, uh, Chinese equipment, rather than, than stuff from the United States. That said, it's important to note that the number, for example, the number of embassies and consulates in Vientiane is somewhere under 30. Okay, we'll put that into context. There are somewhere close to 200 countries in the world total. So if there was an embassy or consulate for each one, each country in the world, then there would be somewhere close to 200. But for, you know, mostly economic reasons, only 24 or so countries have chosen to have physical representation in the Lao PDR in terms of an embassy or consulate in the capital of Yintian. The U.S. is one of them. We're one of the 24. In fact, we have a new embassy right on the Mekong, about 20 minutes out of Yintian, which I've driven by. I haven't actually gone inside. It's this very imposing structure right on the river there. It looks very American. And it shows to me uh, to our credit, that the United States is one of only a couple dozen or so, along with many European countries, including my other, uh, my, the other heritage that I have, which was I'm half Swiss, so the Swiss have an embassy there, the Europeans do, the Chinese, of course, do. So it appears to me, to our credit, that the United States does see the benefit and the value, the necessity of continuing to remain very engaged mm. in the region. And that raises because... the whole question that's come up, um, you know, about isolationism, about withdrawing from uh, international relations in this administration. Um, and it raises the question about other countries like China, Russia, 
and European countries for that matter, filling the void uh, and taking our prerogatives away from us while we, while we withdraw. And I wonder if you saw indications of that while you were there. And, and I wonder also what the local people, uh, I, I guess it might be different from country to country, but what they feel about the U.S. and its policies of withdrawal. I think they continue to see a very uh, engaged American presence in the Lao PDR. In fact, there, the ambassador there is a career foreign service officer uh, whose name I'm picking up, I'm, I'm looking up right now, who gets quite a bit of press and is very, very uh, highly thought of. Her name is Ambassador Rena Bitter, B-I-T-T-E-R, and she has been very active in terms of, uh, of connecting with the locals and going to areas that need to disaster help due to flooding of the monsoons and the, and the collapse of this dam. So surprisingly, Jay, and I'll tell you a little story, which uh, really kind of uh, stabbed, at my, stabbed at my heart, my guide in Luang Prabang was a local fellow by the name of Kamlak, uh, and he took the American name Alec, because it was close to his, his Lao name. Mm -hmm. uh, educated in uh, Switzerland, my half-home country was Switzerland, and uh, probably late 30s, early 40s, and a uh, very charming fellow, and he was comes from a family of uh, eight or nine, and his sister, his older sister, was killed all of three months ago, she had three grown kids or in their late teens, uh, killed because she was a farmer and she was uh, working in her farm and uh, one of her farming implements hit uh, UXO, Unexploded Ordnance, which mm. is, uh, I'll say, in a, in a very tragic, tragic way. Tragic years and years day. afterward, too, yeah, years and years. Decades, Jay, you decades, know, 50, yeah. 40, 50 years ago since Laos was the most bombed country in the history of the world mm. from roughly 1964 to 1973. So when he shared with me that his sister was killed, and here I'm an American there talking to him, I mean, I felt this, this pang of shame. And I said, how is it that you can, you know, what does that cause you to feel towards the Americans? And, and he just kind of shrugged and said, well, you know, that's, that's the way it was, but we're, we're working together now. So to answer your question, I found the energy towards Americans to be very, very positive. And you'll find the same thing in Vietnam as well. And keep in mind that more than half the population of Vietnam was born after 1975, which is when the country was reunified when the, the Communist North took over the South. So it's, it's really striking to me the powers of, of forgiveness, yeah. despite... The well, fact that the American presence the, there over decades continues to kill people, continues through yeah. UXO and the use of massive amounts of defoliant. But unbalanced. Uh, has been unbalanced, you know, impact. taking that aside and, and taking, you know, the creature comforts I'm sure you experienced, putting that on the side. Uh, having spent, what, six, seven weeks over there, uh, you must have a feeling about the future of Southeast Asia, about where it's going, where it's going in energy, where it's going in, in economy and geopolitical issues, relationship with China. And so now, you know, I think it's the right time for me to ask you that, that question. Are you optimistic? Where do you see it all going? What kind of role will Southeast Asia play and the, and the countries in Southeast Asia, East Asia play uh, in the years going forward? You must have a feeling about that, Marco. Oh, that's a great question. We could, we could talk another half hour, an hour about that. Uh, I see the region as incredibly dynamic and just kind of focusing on one country because I know we don't have too much time left. But No, we only have uh, a minute Laos. left, so make, make it short. Laos has uh, an increase in visitors 10% per year. You do the math, you come up with 60% more visitors in the next five years, 250% compounded over the next 10 years. So I'm convinced that more and more Americans, more and more Europeans, more and more Chinese, more and more Japanese are going to come to the region for investment, for vacation, for exploration. And I see that part of the world uh, becoming more and more, playing more and more of a role, uh, whether through ASEAN or, or, Indi or through independent states. I see the profile of Southeast Asia, and then you add in countries like Malaysia to the south and Indonesia off the coast to be adding to the clout, both uh, in terms of e economic, energy resource issues, and uh, its position in world politics. Ah, we got to watch it. We got to stay fixed on it, focused on it, and we'll watch it. And you've got to go back, and I'll take your your bag alongside and <laughs> help you help you travel. 
That's Marco Mangelsdorf, just came back from a trip to Southeast Asia. So interesting to talk to him about that. And our discussion is not finished. We can drill down next time and talk some more about what he learned and what we can learn from them. Thank you so much, Marco. It's great to have you back. It's great to talk to you again. Always a great pleasure, Jay. And you can be your, my, my faithful man, Sir J. Fidel, anytime. <laughs> I'm writing that down. <laughs> Thank you, Marco. Mahalo, my friend. Thank you.